put, they put her into a delirium state, and it took them a few months before she actually went up in the emergency room with it. By this time, they got rid of the delirium, but by then they had kind of burned out her brain and she had a long going uh, dementia uh, from it. And depending on the underlying cause, some of these things, if they go on for like months or years, can be easier to prove. What about older adults that make up stories that have no semblance of truth whatsoever? Is that depends on the cause. I mean, it, it could be if it's a coherent story, it's probably not delirium. Yeah. Um, we but talk some more about dementia in a minute. People that don't people that don't know the answers to your question because of dementia will often make up answers. Like my grandma made and up And then some people are just like liars. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. I was talking about my uh, grandmother came up with a story about going for bike rides, which I don't think she's ridden a bike since she was like 13. I, and, but it took place like 20 years ago. My father now says that he went to temple with my, with my mother's father like a couple dozen times. Man's never stepped foot in the temple in his entire life. There, there, there are both <laughs> more benign lie. reasons and also, uh, and also dementia-related reasons that people can come up with. Like oh, that that makes more sense. Sense. Uh, um, I was also going to add that a very common infection is um, the typical bladder infection mm. in older adults, um, which I personally know my mother had a couple weeks ago, and it did cause delirium. Yeah, urinary tract infections yeah. not uncommon. Respiratory infections can do it, although they're usually more obvious and, and more likely to get attention. Right. The UTIs sometimes don't really get noticed, especially well, if, if one of the main effects is urinary incontinence. And again, because you're old, people think that being incontinent is normal. Or your, you know, lack of hygiene. Yeah. You know, this is where that kind of ADL needs to be addressed. Um, with some older people, they, they start to not take care of themselves, and then that can lead yeah. to chronic infections like UTIs. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, on to dementia. I had a question. Sure. Um, well, delirium, sometimes you might have older people in the hospital and they sort of get violent, and what's the protocol on using soft restraints? On older adults because it might help you know, help them from hurting themselves but it might hurt them in the long term with being restrained and sort of agitate the delirium further so it's just wondering what the approach is in that respect um, it'll vary from hospital to hospital I think places will have different policies on exactly when we use restraints I think we're getting less prone to use restraints than we used to be, both physical and chemical. But I would say if it really is necessary to protect people from hurting themselves or accidentally being hurt, um, it's still done in a lot of places. Does it show that soft restraints hurt them in a long run, sort of um, cognitively? Cognitively, probably. I, I think the issue is being probably more around. Uh, physical restraint, and we're, we're also getting sufficient exercise and range of motion and so forth. Um, if you were doing it, and I think increasingly this is you know, built into requirements in nursing homes, especially uh, hospitals usually have a little more latitude because it's more acute care. Um, if you're doing it primarily for behavioral or cognitive reasons, you probably want to explore what, whether there are other ways to handle the situation. It is increased, increasing, although still not hugely common, um, reliance on or use of more psychological and environmental ways of handling the same issues rather than tying you down or breaking the senses. Yeah, Trisha? Uh, well, I can tell you from experience, when I started out as a, an RN in the in the early 80s, um, it was very customary to use the restraints. Um, and you know, I can happily say that's not the case much these days. Uh, you try to avoid using restraints. But when the staff is 
overwhelmed with workload. It's sometimes just in the patient's best, um, uh, their best, you know, outcome not to be able to get up and fall, uh, so they're restrained. But it's less and less now. Okay. Can you want to do something in a different order than the way it had it slides? Um, this, this is a, um, a set of terms that I think need to be, should be used much more precisely than they tend to be in a lot of gerontology and social gerontology stuff uh, and in prevalence estimates of dementia in late life. Um, and they also, um, the first couple especially, you know, cause all kinds of problems that really part of the way towards being able to fix. But um, normal aging we've been talking about up until now. So um, the one thing I would add in terms of today is that you, you know quite a bit about the changes that we think probably occur with normal aging. Um, we probably haven't mentioned yet that most of the pathological changes in the brain that are visible at autopsy that we tend to associate with dementia are present to a degree, but to a much lesser degree in aging without dementia. Um, we do we are certain to virtually certain, though, that it's not just a matter of living long enough everybody gets dementia. I've heard our BioGero folks talk about the, the lady that made it to over 120 in France uh, several years back uh, was still cognitively intact at least 120, 121. And clearly there are, a lot, there are people who make it um, past the century mark who are still uh, not demented, um, although it may be that by the century mark, the majority of people have fairly serious kind of impairment. Um, this is where the rubber hits the road, if you will, in terms of, especially as you get into the old, old years and the older you get, the more of a problem this is. If you think that there's cognitive impairment due to normal aging, and you're looking at a dementia that has a slow and progressive onset. How do you know when one leaves off and the other starts? <coughs> and if, if you were, uh, the Martha Storant paper for today, Martha is, is either is retiring now or retired a year or so ago from Washington University in St. Louis. She's one of the original um, clinical geropsych people. She's done a lot of neuropsych stuff. And, a lot of it published in, in neurology as well as in psychology uh, journals. She's been on the search for early signs of AD uh, probably longer than just about anybody. And I would trust Martha's judgment on these matters more than I would trust anybody. There's a couple of things she says in that paper that ought to bother me at this point. Anybody have a guess as to what they might be? So, possible early signs of Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that she points to is, um, is frontal lobe problems and uh, inhibition okay. issues. You know, all of you really love the Von Hippel paper, which says frontal lobe problems and inhibition issues are probably normal aging. So you know, this is probably not the kind of place you want to look. Or at least you'd have to have some way of separating out how much of the inhibition failure would you expect at this age because of aging and how much more would be an early sign of dementia. She also mentions uh, slowing on some tasks. You know, prob probably better. Um, she talks about certain kinds of shifts in semantic memory. Um, being more likely to be associated with Alzheimer's disease. I think somatic memory is very well preserved in normal aging. So if we can